Welcome back to the Credible Dev YouTube channel. Haven't made a video in a little bit, so I wanted to update you guys on what's kind of been going on in my life, some things that I've been working on, and yeah, just give you an update on uh, kind of where I'm at. So let's go ahead and jump into it. First thing that I want to call out uh, right off the bat is that I'm no longer using Proxmox or Hyper-V or any of the other things that I've used in the past necessarily. I needed the PC that I typically ran Proxmox on for some other purposes, so I needed to have an OS actually installed on uh, that machine instead of using virtual machines. I do still use virtual machines, however, what we're looking at on the screen here is an Ubuntu install that I have, and I have Virtual Machine Manager, which uses KVM, QMU. Uh, which is very similar to what Proxmox does, except in this instance, I have an actual desktop OS installed, and then I'm just using KVM to run those individual VMs, much like you would in Proxmox. A lot of the same things that you can do in Proxmox, you'd still be able to do with this. Just the added benefit for me in my particular case is having that underlying OS running on the machine that I can do things with. Unlike with Proxmox, where you're kind of just limited to the the uh, portal that you get or the console that you get to manage the machines. And sure, there is an underlying OS there that you could use. But, you know, it, it just made more sense for me to move over to a full desktop install on that device and then manage the virtual machines using something else. I could have used VirtualBox or whatever, but I chose to use Virtual Machine Manager. And you can see here that I do have TrueNAS running, which is a lot of my um, storage. I have a few shares running on there. My Plex, it pulls its content from there. And I have a Windows 11 VM that I'm using for some testing for some other things that I'm working on. So yeah, right now, Ubuntu with KVM uh, using Virtual Machine Manager is what I'm using today. Will I go back to Proxmox? possibly in the future there's nothing really wrong with proxmox it was just my need for that underlying os with a desktop on it that drove my decision to move off of proxmox so yeah that's the first big thing that i wanted to call out and i, I don't believe that i've made any videos about virtual machine manager it's a lot of guides online setting it up it's not too difficult and, you know, you can still do things like with the true NADs, I'm passing through the hard disk to it. So that way it has full control over there with as much control as it possibly can in this scenario. But, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in a video on that, maybe you're wanting to set up something similar to that. You know, maybe you're in a situation where you have one machine uh, that you're using and you can't really install Proxmox on it. And it's not going to work in your scenario. You know, maybe this is something you might want to do versus using VirtualBox or something else. Nothing wrong with VirtualBox. It, it works for a lot of those VM instances that you need as well. So if that's what you're doing. You know, you may not have a reason to change that. But anyway, if anybody's interested in a video on that, leave a comment down below. I'm sure I can uh, create a video to help you guys along with getting this set up. So the next thing that I want to talk about is some of the projects that I've been working on. So, uh, well, actually, since I just pulled this up, I'll talk about this first. So, um, you know, I had, I made a video in the past about University of the People. That was a school that I was going to, an online school. You know, you kind of, you sort of work at your own pace, uh, but not exactly because you're still stuck with, you know, you have to take this class for eight weeks and this class for eight weeks. So, you know, if you wanted to go through it faster, maybe you're really familiar with the material. You were kind of wasting your time waiting for each week for new assignments to be released and things like that. Now, I was a little frustrated with uh, uh, one of the classes that I took on machine learning and the content was a little outdated, I felt like. So I thought it was time for a change. I did a little bit of research. WGU is another big online school that a lot of people use so decided to give it a shot so right now i'm in the enrollment process which is uh, submitting all my transcripts which i've already done i took some additional classes on sophia learning if you've looked on youtube about wgu a lot of people recommend multiple different sites like straighter line sophia learning and some others for you to kind of knock out some additional courses pretty quickly before you start at wgu 
So I, I did a little bit of that, but not too much. Uh, if we go over to Sophia Learning, you can see these are the classes that I took over the last month. Part of the reason why I haven't been making videos was this. And um, so I did calculus and a few other courses. The calculus course is a prerequisite. You need at least a pre-calculus. But if you go to Sophia and you just take calculus one, it knocks out your prereq that you need for pre-calculus and it knocks out the actual course requirement for calculus one that WGU would have. So it's kind of killing two birds with one stone there. Uh, these courses on Sophia, and you can blow through them. I mean, many of these I did in a day. Uh, the calculus was not one of those. That one, I, I think I took a week or two uh, to complete the calculus course. And these aren't proctored. Uh, so when you go to take the exam, like with calculus, you can use online calculators that will make it a little easier for you. I mean, you're not going to be able to just jump in there and use that calculator without some prior knowledge of calculus and actually going through the course some because you're going to have to know what to put into that calculator to start with. But it wasn't too difficult. Um, the environmental science, the human biology lab, things like that, they were pretty easy to go through. A few of these classes do have assignments that are reviewed and, and kind of graded by someone else. So some of them, you're kind of waiting on those assignments to be graded. Uh, but many of them, that's not the case. You basically just go through the content and you have these little mini tests along the way, like milestone tests. And at the end, you have one final test. And again, they're not really proctored, so you can blow through them pretty quick. So that's what I did here. And right now, all my transcripts and everything have been sent over to WGU. So at this point, I'm just kind of waiting um, to, to get enrolled at this point. So anyway, it's moving on from that. Uh, I have been working on a couple of different apps, one of them being a web app which uh, is something I, I just had an idea in my head about something cool that I could create. And I really wanted to use uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI's API uh, and get some exposure with it and learn how to use it. So I come up with this idea for all the Microsoft exams that are out there about creating a site where people can submit learning resources. So, you know, whatever you use to prepare for an exam, a certain website, certain course, whatever, you could go to the exam here uh, for Microsoft, and then within that, you could submit the training resource that you used, and then people can upvote and downvote those training resources to kind of rank how good the training resource is for preparing you for the exam. So I haven't quite gotten to that part of it yet. Um, what I have done as far as the chat GPT side was uh, first I used Selenium to scrape the Microsoft exam site. So I was scraping this site to get like exam codes and like the name of the exam. And then what I did was I used chat GPT to actually create a description and I use Python to do that. Uh, so basically, I reach out to the OpenAI API, and I tell it here to give me a short description on that particular Microsoft exam with that exam code and get some information about it, the description and its cost. And then all that gets collected, and it gets put into a Cosmos DB up in Azure. And then my app is, of course, just pulling that information down from the uh, Cosmos DB to to populate the site. So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, you don't see the description yet, uh, if I remember right. So we could just look at the uh, what's in the Cosmos DB uh, using the API that I created. This app is built with uh, Next.js, which is pretty similar to React and React.js, kind of a framework uh, built on React.js. So Within it, you can do your API, so you don't necessarily need that separate backend like you used to uh, with maybe like Express or something like that. Uh, it's all kind of bundled into one with Next.js. So what we're looking at here is the API that's within my app uh, and the data that it's pulling from the Cosmos DB. And in this description field, this is the part that ChatGPT generated for me.
And the cost of doing it, I mean, I had to run it a few times, uh, you know, work out bugs and such like that. But the cost of pulling this data on quite a few, uh, quite a few different exams here was pretty minimal. I mean, a few bucks, if that, um, when using the API. And it, it all depends on which chat GPT that you're using, like you're using GPT-4 or 3.5 or whatever. Uh, when you use chat GPT-4 from the API, the cost is a little bit higher. And this information, I got better results with generating it using a 3.5 Turbo, I think, is the API. So, anyways, interesting project. I'm still kind of working on it here and there. Uh, but once I get finished with it, I'll let you guys know. And, of course, it'll be public on the Internet, obviously. So, I'll put a link to it as well whenever it's finished right now. Just working on it in my local environment. So, another thing that I've been working on is an app uh, using Tari, which is built in Rust. If you're familiar with Electron, it's similar to Electron, except it's faster and it's not as bulky. One of the biggest problems with Electron apps is they're really heavy. Like They, they take up a lot of space. A small piece of software that shouldn't be more than maybe a megabyte or something like that explodes in size, because it's technically running your web app inside of Chrome, for instance. like it, 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 So you have that component bundled in with your app. And with Tari, that's not the case. It uses the WebView 2 that is available on most machines today. So it uses that to display your app. So technically, this is a web app that is being displayed here. But like I said, it runs a lot faster than Electron. It's a lot lighter weight. And um, I'd never messed with Tari before, so I was interested in checking it out. And I had this idea for an app a while back, which I actually wrote in C Sharp. And I'm not the greatest with C Sharp. And I needed to add some additional functionality to that app. So I just took what I'd already done with C Sharp and my knowledge of the graph API that Microsoft has and I just translated that over here to a web app and used Tari to run it on basically any device. You can run these Tari apps on Windows, Linux, whatever. Um, I think I think maybe a limitation. I, I haven't messed with mobile. Maybe you could run it on a phone. I have no idea. I haven't I haven't really looked at that because I'm not really interested in the mobile apps like that. But anyways, the goal of this application was to be able to put in a Azure group and then get information about that group that isn't easily exposed in Azure or Intune by default. So in this example here in the app, uh, I have this group that I've put in, and it's telling me obviously the group name, the type of membership, whether it's assigned or a dynamic group, the group ID, and then if you if it is a dynamic group, then the rule over here on how devices or people, whatever case it may be, how they are pulled into this group in an automated fashion. So in this particular case, it is looking at a group tag that is assigned to the devices, and if they have this group tag, they get pulled into the group. The uh, interesting part, and what I really wanted to do here, was collecting information about the applications from Intune, the configuration profiles, proactive remediations, etc., that are assigned to this group. It is difficult to get that information, and I'll show you an example here. So here's the group that I was looking at, and you would think uh, that you'd be able to go over here to the left and click on Applications and maybe see a list of applications that are assigned to this group, but you can see that there's nothing here. And you don't have options to see what all configuration profiles or anything like that are assigned to it either. So in order to find this information, you would have to go to every single app and every single policy that you have in your Intune environment and check whether that group uh, has a, is, is on the assignment there, which would be very time consuming. So instead, you can put your group in here and look it up, and then it'll spit out all the information here. There are some more things that I want to add here. Um, I want to add the ability to clone the assignments from one group to another in a selective manner. Maybe you need to create another group 
that has most of the same assignments as a group you already have. And instead of you having to go into Intune and manually assign your new group to all these apps and whatever that you have in there, instead you could take an existing group that you already have and clone those from one to the other. And you can just, uh, you know, maybe have a checkbox next to each one of the applications, configuration profiles, et cetera. And you can just check or uncheck the ones that you actually want to clone over and it would save you a ton of time. So that's uh, one of the ideas that I have here um, for this app and future improvements. Uh, I have some other things too I won't go into here, but it's kind of a work in progress. So I'll keep you guys updated on it if you're interested in it. Not sure how many of the people that watch my channel actually work in Azure and Intune and things like that. So I'd be curious to know if you do work in this in your work life, uh, leave a comment down below because I'm kind of curious how many people actually do to watch this channel. I know it started out a lot with Linux and things like that, and I do love Linux, still use Linux uh, today. So uh, that really hasn't changed, but I also have a lot of interest into the Azure and Intune and things like that because of my, my work, like my actual job. That's where I spend a lot of my time at. So anyways, uh, that's kind of the update that I have for you guys. Uh, sorry I haven't posted in a while. Uh, I'm not sure what the future of the channel looks like. I'll just make videos as I can and as I have topics that come up in my mind that I want to talk about. And hopefully you guys appreciate that and enjoy the, the content. But if there's anything you would like for me to make a video about, leave a comment down below and let me know as of right now. I don't have a lot of ideas for new videos, so I welcome any suggestions that you guys have. And that's really all I've got for you today. I really appreciate you checking out this video. If you stuck around to the end, thank you. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks.